you for uh, showing up to listen to my presentation. I know it's been recorded, so there are several others who will join us uh, as we go forward. Uh, basically, um, I am visiting Duke today, uh, and I leave shortly uh, to um, back to DC and then uh, back to Nigeria. But I am really happy to have had this opportunity to share what we're doing in Nigeria. My objectives were basically to share uh, the challenges facing Nigeria's health system uh, and it's the links of those challenges to the poor health outcomes we are experiencing and provide you with an overview of recent initiatives to improve the demand as well as supply of basic health services such as uh, polio immunization, routine immunization and maternal health services, uh, different health system frameworks. but. This is taking a very practical uh, approach, looking at what have we done on the ground in Nigeria to improve health outcomes, and then share some results that we have uh, demonstrated and maybe draw some conclusions. So I will just give a talk, um, uh, basically an outline of Nigerian health system, the realities and challenges, which in the last mile, some of the results, and then outline some conclusions. This is the country, as many of you uh, know already. It's a federation of 36 states, 774 local governments, uh, 152 million people, mostly rural, uh, mostly poor, more than 70%, and five main languages with really diversity of dialects, of everything, weak infrastructure, power, all the challenges you see in uh, resource poor settings. Uh, basically, we have, and this is the picture of the map of the country. Uh, this is uh, just to give you a sense of the, f of, of the population, very diverse from the big cities, rural population, nomadic population, young children, a very youthful population also, uh, as well as uh, you can see, this is a picture we took in uh, two months ago basically on the banks of a river. And that's, uh, that's a family living really in a settlement in the northeastern part of the country. So it's very basic. Um, uh, uh, sort of uh, structure. The health system is very decentralized and that follows the decentralized system of governance that we have uh, with the three tiers, the federal government, state and local government just like you have here in the United States. Uh, the federal government is responsible for national policy, uh, the teaching hospitals uh, and then the National Primary Health Care Development Agency where I work. And the state is responsible for the general hospitals and local government responsible for basic services. But that is really where we have an issue. There's a structural constraint. Fiscal decentralization, three levels of government, but yet not sufficient accountability mechanisms. So local governments get flows, and they don't really have to um, use those resources to attend to the basic needs of the population. Um, this is just a picture of the health workforce that we have. I think the summary here is that we are a large country with large pool of human resources. But well, there's a huge distributional issue. Many of the human resources are in the private sector, the senior, the doctors, the pharmacists, and some zones of the country are less uh, endowed with human resources for health than other areas. So there's a huge maldistribution. And access and utilization of basic intervention is also limited. Uh, you can see DHS data from 1990. Uh, skilled birth attendance, 31%, 42%. At 39% as of 2008, not much progress in that sense. And coverage in the continuum of care from contraceptive prevalence, uh, low antenatal visits, postnatal care exclusion. So the coverage of basic interventions uh, are still quite limited. And then huge inequities in access to care. This is an analysis of the DHS data from 2008, uh, showing uh, the difference between the lowest 20% of the population from the highest 20% of the population. You can see from medical treatment of fever, just about half, uh, and then full immunization, almost tenfold difference between the richest and the poorest. So this is quite a significant inequity uh, which we are observing. This is not limited to Nigeria, but to give you a sense of the challenge that we have. And when we compare what we have in Nigeria compared to other countries in Africa, uh, this picture compares Nigeria with Ghana, Kenya, Cameroon, Morocco, and Mozambique. And between the lowest and the highest income quintiles, you'll find that uh, the Nigeria uh, highest income quintiles are here, but the lowest are here. So this gives you a relative sense of the inequities in distribution of health outcomes in Nigeria compared to other countries. And then where do we spend our money 
uh, for which activities the health dollar in Nigeria, uh, most of it is in curative care, 74%. This is according to the National Health Account uh, 2005, which was published by Soigo in 2009. And public health gets 14%, but this is where you get the most uh, value for money in terms of public health outcomes. So in 2008, we had a major polio outbreak, and the 61st World Health Assembly um, passed a resolution specifically urging Nigeria to reduce the risk of international spread of polio virus by quickly stopping the outbreak in northern Nigeria. This is a major turning point uh, for us because there is international condemnation, and uh, this is the World Health Assembly. And in summary, what I've done in this first part of the presentation is to give you a sense of the health system challenges, what we're facing in terms of the human resource, the infrastructural issue, the financing, uh, the maldistribution, in the, and then the polio issue, which is more symptomatic of the underlying failure of the health system and routine immunization. Uh, so we've got poor and inequitable health outcomes, uh, mismatch between resource allocation and spending, uh, as well as the burden of disease, uh, the polio crisis, which was symptomatic of the failure of immunization and uh, primary health care system, and uh, supply side constraints, which we have, uh, the skilled workforce that was suboptimal in the rural areas, uh, inadequate infrastructure, and the poor quality standards, which I have uh, mentioned, but which are there, and then demand side constraints. For polio, we had misperception among a large portion of our population thinking that the polio vaccine could be harmful to their children, and they refused in 2003, 2004. So there were lots of misperception, lack of awareness of the benefit of immunization. Of course, institutional capacity limitations, uh, including management capacity and governance, which affected the performance of the health system. So the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, where I work, basically uh, is a parasite of the Foreign Ministry of Health, and uh, we have a mandate to support state and local government to deliver basic services. And our aspiration is to make Nigerians healthy, and we have seven goals, including the control of preventable diseases, improving access, improving quality, uh, strengthening our community engagement, developing high-performing workforce, uh, which is one of what we're uh, aspiring to do, strengthen partnerships, as well as strengthen the institution itself. This is basically our mantra, where we're heading as an institution. And uh, let me just uh, transit then to what have we done in the last two and a half years, uh, using the platform of the National Primary Health Care Development Agency to tackle the challenges, uh, basically in two areas, stimulating demand and also improving the supply of basic services. And I will share with you uh, just pictures, but also how we've been able to do it. Starting with polio, we know the wild polio virus paralyzes children irreversibly. And polio can only survive in humans. An oral polio vaccine, uh, which is not what is used in this country and most developed countries, uh, when given multiple times, completely protects children against paralysis by the wild polio virus. And this is a picture, basically, a very pathetic picture to tell you what it does. Once a child is crippled, this is a child being hauled upwards to attend school. So it actually has a significant human consequence, even when a child survives polio. This is what it uh, translates even where a child is able to attend school and no one would really want his child or any child in the world to actually suffer from this debilitating disease um, and the global quest to eradicate polio is not something new since 1988 we know that the world had resolved to eradicate polio uh, it is a unique public private partnership uh, led by the WHO, Rotary International uh, US Centers for Disease Control UNICEF uh, national governments Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been investing lots of resources so that the world can eradicate polio as the next disease after smallpox. And the strategies that have been used basically are fourfold. House to house campaigns uh, to reach all children under five, mob ops, surveillance for acute flaccid paralysis, as well as routine immunization. Because that's the bulwark and that depends on the primary health care system or the health system functioning. So what we did in um, February 2009 basically was start with a political commitment because all these issues will not be resolved unless you have political leaders rising up to the challenge. So we went to the state governors in a federal system we needed to get the commitment of the federal government so we used the visit of Mr. Bill Gates to uh, rally the state governors 
uh, around this polio issue so that we can demonstrate results. And this is just an example. Uh, within a very short period of time, we had several state governors coming out publicly to uh, launch, immunize, and participate in this national effort to eradicate polio. Then we move on to traditional leaders. As we know, in almost all parts of Africa, there are traditional institutions that preceded the institutions of modern state. And those institutions are still relevant and legitimate in the eyes of people. So we reach a traditional institution. Uh, this gentleman here is the Sultan of Sokoto. He is the sort of ultimate leader of the traditional institution, even though he is outside really the, uh, the modern state institution. And you have several of them. Uh, basically, it's a very huge network, an informal network. So we went then to sell this idea of polio, routine immunization, as well as effort to improve access to population by uh, uh, basic services. This is just to give you an example, a room full of traditional leaders in Emirate, uh, in one Emirate, just one Emirate in northwestern Nigeria in 2010. So sort of engaging them before a campaign, getting them uh, mobilized around it, and getting their buy-in. Uh, that was very important. I think it's difficult to see the significance of this now. Uh, when the polio vaccine was being rejected in 2003, 2004, this segment of our society was totally not engaged. Uh, was engaged in some areas in a negative way, really. So, and the network of the traditional institution basically reaches to the grassroots, uh, from the Sultan of Sokoto to the emirs to district heads, to settlement at more than 145,000. There is no part of our country that has no traditional leader that has domain over those areas, even though they are outside the structure of the modern state. And we need to use them creatively uh, so that they can help mobilize people increase the demand for what we're uh, trying to do in terms of polio eradication. And we use them to, in the planning and review meetings within their hierarchy uh, for them to carry out advocacy to the leaders, the political leaders at the states, local government chairmen, to do dialogue, to do what we call magiki, to model, to immunize their children. Um, the Sultan here is immunizing uh, a child in his palace to endorse publicly our effort, to plan for the campaigns, and to resolve non-compliance, and I'll show some data as to how that effect, how that has been effective. Um, then we took it further to sort of uh, reach the hardest to reach areas, because, like I said, Nigeria is predominantly a rural country. It's a large country, very diverse, but there are many hard to reach areas. So we're using auto vehicles. This was a recent uh, picture from northeastern part of the country where we took an hour and a half uh, to reach a village. Uh, this particular village where the only service that was reaching them was actually the immunization program. And this is the boat that we donated to them. And this is us trying to uh, make our landing really in the village, uh, trying to reach the hard to reach areas because the polio virus can hide in the remotest corner of our country or any country for that matter. And from there, it can be exported to any part of the world. So we cannot talk about eradication if there are pockets of areas where children are not immunized. And that last mile includes the nomads. Uh, these are sort of uh, just picture show what we've uh, kinds of uh, areas. And this is basically another uh, riverine area. The uh, um, markets, road networks, so that we can immunize as many children as we can. And then we improved our ward communication strategy so that we have high risk wards where children are not being immunized and analyze why that is so the result from each of the wards, and then supervise uh, the quality of immunization in those particular wards so that as many children are rich in those areas. Then identify and implement intensified communication activities targeted at those high-risk areas, and monitor those areas for change, and then in an iterative manner uh, continue to improve the quality of our program. This is all get towards improving the demand by getting people out to receive uh, vaccination, to let their children actually be immunized. And then we took an effort which is not conventional. You wouldn't really hear about this in terms of traditional public health uh, interventions. But the Majigi um, is a hustle word. Uh, we start to, it's from the magic lantern in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, the projectors uh, that basically uh, were being used in rural areas to project to populations uh, public information messages which drifted away. So we re-invited, we re-um, 
we re-established that system and targeted the highest risk settlements and brought in the traditional leaders in those areas mm -hmm. so that they are leading the Majiki efforts in their own respective domains. These are just pictures uh, and that's the screen. And this is at night where we brought in women as well as village heads to actually participate in this. And what we've seen is that with that, uh, this is just a uh, uh, comparison from June and August last year, basically, uh, before and after. You can see significant uh, increases before and after in terms of coverage of children where we've had the magic. Year. And that has continued. And we've replicated in many of the high-risk areas. And then we tried to innovate. Um, innovate in the sense that we have teams reaching settlements, but you can't really say whether they have covered all aspects of the settlement. So with the WHO, this was piloted using GPS for route validation among immunization teams. And this is to give you a sense of where the teams have been visited. It's a small gadget which you're familiar with, uh, which basically can track where the teams have been. It's appended to their vaccination uh, carrier. And you can see there are large segments of this settlement that were not covered. And you can then use it to get them to go back. So trying to use technology to innovate, really trying to get uh, every child uh, immunized. And then we looked at the routine immunization system and they did a flow map from forecasting and planning uh, to the identifying for procurement of the vaccines for routine vaccines beyond polio now, uh, to the cold chain infrastructure, uh, to zoral cold stores where those vaccines are stored, uh, to the local government cold chains, to the facilities where the vaccines are stored, and then to the delivery to patients, both polio as well as other vaccines. This was an effort to sort of try to, under, to address the underlying systemic gaps. So we took the polio issue as a symptom of a wider failing of the health system. So address it through the campaign, through mobilization and communication, but also try to address all the systemic issues by looking at the process flow over time. And we revitalize the culture infrastructure, give you a sense of the cold rooms, um, and then some of the physical access. Uh, this is a facility, rural facility, before and after, just to give you a sense of the infrastructural revival that was necessary in order to attract people to those facilities. This is now working on the supply side. I think after generating the demand, people will have to go to the facilities to get these uh, services. And then, 400 facilities basically were renovated. This is an example of some of the facilities renovated, equipped, and also staffed. I'll come to that on the supply side so that people will utilize basic services. Then we launched, this is in 2009, October, um, as part of this effort, Human Resources uh, Initiative, the Midwifery Service Scheme, where we had 4,000 midwives deployed to 1,000 primary health care centers in the most remote areas of the country and an additional 1,000 health workers last year, community health workers. Um, they were provided with medical equipment, essential medical supplies, trained with uh, life saving <coughs> skills, integrated management of childhood illnesses, community mobilization around those facilities through the formation of ward committees, uh, organizing system wide monitoring, uh, supervision, as well as mentoring of those midwives so that more older midwives can be paired with uh, the younger midwives and then using mobile technology and ICT technology for monitoring, data transmission, feedback, and e-learning. This is an intervention on the supply side, tackling human resources in the front lines. Um, and this is the hub and spoke model that we've used. So for the midwifery service scheme, the um, primary health care uh, uh, center, basically four of them around a general hospital. So they are organized in four primary health care centers around a general hospital so that there will be a referral backup for the rural midwives. And I'll share with you some of the results uh, we've seen. These are the midwives, and this is um, just an example where we had uh, uh, co co network yeah. computer connectivity, internet-based connectivity between 200, a subset of those primary health care centers. And all of the centers had mobile phones that were being used, and I'll show some of the results uh, for you. And then the mid-level management capacity, yeah. I mentioned Management capacity is an issue. So, and uh, Will Mitchell is here uh, with him. We conceptualized this mid-level management training program, uh, which was aimed at building the capacity of primary healthcare managers to promote more effective use of current levels of resources for higher impact. So, we identified uh, three mid-level managers in each state, so 111, that formed the first cohort, and then uh, used a 
continuing education model over a period of six months, uh, over, over six sessions, which was intended over six months, but in reality actually took a bit longer. But the first cohort graduated in August, and it's been evaluated, the second phase evaluation is ongoing, but preliminary indication is that in fact that training was very useful. Uh, the health managers were not always trained in management. They graduated into management capacities without having had the broad-based management education. And that this is an intervention that we think will pay dividend downstream. And Duke was part of this uh, effort. So what I've done is share with you the wider system challenges, the polio issue that was symptomatic, what we've done in terms of the communication and community mobilization using traditional institution, as well as on the supply side from human resources, infrastructure, as well as uh, um, the management capacity, what we've done. So I'll share with you some of the results that we've seen. This is not done in the context of a trial. Uh, it's a result that uh, we can discuss uh, later with you. So when we come to polio eradication, this is um, uh, a picture basically of the situation 2008, 2009, 2010 in terms of polio virus in Nigeria. And you can see where we were in 2008, getting a little bit better in 2009 and 2010. But in terms of genetic clusters of polio virus type 1, this is analysis by CDC, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, uh, where you have C32 clusters in 2008, and that shrunk, and then only three <coughs> of these four clusters are, were found in 2010 in Nigeria. And from what the experts, the virologists are telling us, this is very impressive uh, progress in terms of shrinking of the virologic clusters of wild polio virus circulating in Nigeria, which confirms that the progress we're seeing is in fact real. And this is the 2008 picture when we had um, the World Health Assembly passing a resolution uh, with a good surveillance system that has remained good up until now. Um, this is 2009 where we halved the number of cases, and then 2010, we had only 21 cases. And this year, we've had only one case up to until March. So it's quite an impressive um, uh, trajectory in terms of polio, and it's given hope that, in fact, this disease might be eradicable uh, in the coming years all over the world. And this is the type 1 cases. Uh, you can see um, where we are basically after the large epidemic. Uh, it's cyclical disease. But we're hoping that we'll keep this push uh, until we actually interrupt it. These are the campaign rounds that we've had, but we've just improved the quality of those campaign rounds, coupled with the community mobilization that I mentioned to you. And this is type 3, so type 1 under control, and also type 3, you can see the similar trajectory, and then also uh, the circulating vaccine drive polioviruses also uh, coming under control. We had a small outbreak in 2009. We were able to rapidly bring it under control with a trivalent oral polio vaccine. And I think uh, we're seeing progress across the three types of the virus, across the genetic clusters of the virus, and we're seeing increasing coverage uh, of wild polio virus vaccine, I mean, against, uh, with vaccine against the virus. And this is some picture, basically, where we are. But now, how do you know that this is real? Well, the surveillance system is good. But we also are looking at the community immunity against the polio uh, virus. And this is comparison of the OPV status of the non-polio AFP uh, rates uh, among children in the very high risk and high risk states. From 2006, zero doses, more than three is good. Uh, um, 36, this is not good. 36% means there's a huge immunity gap. And 2007, 2008, and then this is where we were in 2009. And by 2010, we basically have uh, not many cases anyway, so we're not able to tell. But from this, it makes it plausible. The changes that we're seeing in the viral transmission is actually confirmed by improving population immunity. And when you look at the, uh, the, the uh, three plus doses among non-polio AFP cases, you're seeing a significant improvement between uh, uh, these, uh, 2009 and 2010. So further confirming to us that in fact it's not like we're missing cases. The changes we're seeing is actually uh, good. Then another epidemic that we've been dealing with in Nigeria is cerebrospinal meningitis. This is just a slide to show you the downward trend that we've seen in the last uh, two years. 
Then routine immunization. I'm just trying to cover quite a bit of uh, aspects of the health system and interventions uh, to sort of give you a sense of what we've been doing. We had a um, uh, national immunization coverage survey uh, in 2010 in December, which was just completed. And this is uh, 2003 DHS data. This is 2006 national immunization coverage. And this is a 2010 uh, uh, national immunization coverage survey. So it's a population-based survey using WHO tools and methodology. So it gives us more credibility than administrative data for routine immunization. And we're seeing improvement in uh, BCG coverage, uh, basically compared to where we were in 2006. We're seeing DPT3 coverage, 36% to 67%, uh, which is uh, also uh, good. Uh, we're seeing measles coverage has gone up, and OPV3 coverage, which has been rejected before, uh, even in the routine system, we're seeing it more than 70%, which further tells us that the effort to improve routine immunization, partly because of investment in cold chain, in human resources, in uh, the demand side, we're seeing a less increase in uptake in this. And then the fully immunized ch ch children uh, rate basically has gone up to 53.01 percent in 2010 uh, compared to where it was in 2006. So hopefully, um, we, I'll, uh, I'll qualify this. I think we're seeing evidence that the immunization coverage is improving in Nigeria. And even though it was not in the context of a, uh, a, a rigorous uh, a clinical trial or a study, but from the program data that we have collected, trying to evaluate the progress we're making, we're seeing improvements. Um, then for other aspects of the primary health care system, like maternal health, antenatal care utilization, I mentioned the midwife service scheme, where we posted 4,000 midwives. And from those facilities where we posted the midwives, and using the mobile telephony, where we report, we get the reports of utilization from those facilities. Uh, this is basically a comparison of uh, ANC attendance uh, in the areas under the midwifery service scheme. Uh, in terms of total ANC visits, we're seeing improvements. Uh, new ANC visits also. Uh, ANC 4 plus visits, but also women receiving two doses of TT. Now, this is monitoring data. We have an impact evaluation, which is rigorously designed in collaboration with the World Bank. Baseline was collected in 2010 early and we hope to collect uh, the next set of data end of 2011. That will give us much more robust data as to whether this program has made an impact. But as a program, uh, we are monitoring whether in fact women are, more women are coming to attend our uh, facilities. And we're seeing that in fact, David is suggesting that new ANC visits uh, is going up. Mind you, the uh, zones where you have the most, is actually at the zones where we have more facilities and where the need was highest in this, in the, to start with. The same thing with the terms of the, this is basically the same uh, um, uh, data. So what we are trying to also uh, do is to improve the planning and management of the resources at the front lines, uh, improving the quality and access to immunization as well as maternal uh, services across the midwifery service scheme sites, the thousand primary health care centers, uh, trying to improve the supportive supervision uh, in terms of the facilities at the front lines so that the health workers will get support, uh, technical support uh, to sort out bottlenecks and issues that they are dealing with, um, improve linkages of the services with communities, community committees but also traditional institutions so the demand side is also uh, being uh, attended to. Uh, we're trying to link also with the National Health Insurance Scheme on a different uh, project that I've not highlighted here and then a more intensified monitoring and review process of the various initiatives through an expert review committee that we have with the WHO immunization task groups and the impact evaluation that I mentioned uh, with the World Bank. And at every opportunity trying to integrate various services so that they're delivered at the primary health care center. So that the primary health care centers would be the retail outlets really for health services to the population, not fragmented uh, immunization program standing on its own and uh, HIV and uh, PMTCT all in their own respective ways. We're trying to bring them together using the PHC as a horizontal platform for the of basic services. So I think what I've done, if I can just um, share with you, is 
uh, I give you a sense of what we've done in the last two and a half years uh, in Nigeria from uh, the polio immunization, routine immunization, but also the maternal child health agenda. And uh, while it's a complex uh, system, and certainly Nigeria is a complex country, we've been able to at least demonstrate some areas of improvement uh, that we hope we can sustain uh, going forward. And I believe that um, you can tackle health system challenges uh, from both the supply as well as demand side. If you do it only on one side, obviously it's unlikely to hold. The misperception around polio blocked the polio campaigns and in fact affected routine immunization. But by working with community leaders and improving public awareness, changing perception of people, we're able to improve uptake of that intervention. And using those some institutions, trying to improve uptake of other basic interventions, like attendant and tenantal care, like malaria, uh, bed nets for malaria, those kinds of things uh, from that side. But doing that alone without tackling the human resources, infrastructural, logistics, and other management capacity uh, issue, uh, needs would not also uh, be optimal in a health system that basically is quite complex. And primary preventive services can address important population health <coughs> issues such as vaccine preventable diseases. What we did with polio was to demonstrate the, with the value of vaccination. Uh, we just by increasing vaccination coverage, we brought the disease down. And we've done that with meningitis, which I showed. Uh, measles also, I think we've had a very uh, uh, good um, downward trend uh, over time. And with routine immunization going up, hopefully uh, we'll see improvement in child mobility and mortality. Uh, the next data is in 2013. Hopefully we can demonstrate really good population level impact. Um, then adaptive approaches of using traditional leaders uh, and improving frontline health workforce can improve basic services. Uh, it's amazing that the traditional institution, there's an EMEA that has been in th is, is thrown, is 500 years old. So it's in line of succession that can go back 500 years. That's before the advent of the modern state and even before the advent of modern Nigeria, which is less than 100 years old. So those institutions in our own context uh, exist, but they're not, they're not really part of the instruments of modern state. So adapting our response, looking at the indigenous local institutions and working with them was very helpful in our effort to deal with polio, but also in the other areas we're working on. And um, we do believe that the recent successes we've shown with polio, with routine immunization through the next data that I showed you, um, and the midwife service scheme showing uh, improved utilization of antenatal care services, where we believe that it will uh, contribute significantly to Nigeria's attainment of the MDGs 4 and 5. But this needs to be sustained. So my purpose was to just share with, with this with you and just have a conversation around it. Um, I think this is uh, really my, my purpose. So I want to thank you uh, for, for, for listening to this presentation. And if you have any questions or you want to discuss further or any ideas what we can do better, I'll be very happy to, to take them home with me. Thank you. Maybe I can ask uh, uh, to say a few words. He has been to Nigeria two or three times. Four times, actually. Six or seven times. Yes. Uh, it's actually really exciting. Um, and everything you said is true. Uh, I mean, what, you, what you're doing, what the agency is doing, is really having an impact on the ground. Um, and, and I think, I actually, I was, I was listening to you talk, and, and, I, and I want to pick up on two related things that you started to touch on, but I don't think that, that, that really struck me. Um, and one is the external face of the agency in the communities. And the other, the second, is the shared vision within the agency for what you're trying to accomplish. And I think both of those things have been critically important. Um, because if I look at Nigeria, I see lots and lots of plans going back many, many years. Very good plans, with absolutely no impact. And if I look at South Africa, I see the same thing. And if I look at the US, I see the same thing. And if I look at Canada, I see the same thing. So it's not just an emerging market, it's a develop, developing market that you have lots of plans that don't go anywhere. And in this case, you've actually got some plans that are going somewhere and that are fundamentally affecting people's lives, which is really cool. And it's pretty important. So, and, and, I, and I think the two things that really have driven the difference between just having the plans and actually having an impact with the plans is first that you and the agency have 
created a very strong public face, a trusted face, and an informed face with many aspects of the community. So that when people, when, when there's a polio vaccination or when there's midwives, um, people trust them and, and, and believe that it's appropriate to, to use those services. Um, and that is largely because of you and your staff being in the front lines. Um, traveling, being, being there, communicating, using the magic shows, using you know, everything you can think of, talking to, 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 to traditional healers, respecting traditional healers rather than looking down on them as, from, from, from the point of view of, of Western medicine. Um, and then second, complementing that, it really struck me the time I spent inside the agency, how much people understand what you're trying to accomplish and buy into what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, it's really driven down to a recognition that the, polio, that the vaccination programs are critically important, the MSS is critically important, the MLM is critically important, um, and it's amazing to see how much buy-in there is, and then in turn, how much that translates back into an effective face in the community, because people understand it, they believe it, and so they're credible when they talk to someone in the north or someone in the south or someone in the center, central, about why, and then when they listen to them and understand what they're saying, and can make sense of it and translate it in terms of the goals. And so I think the thing that really struck me, and it's critically important for me, is the fact that it's translated this, it's moved, shifted this from just being a plan to being something that people inside the organization and outside in the communities actually understand and buy into and, and, and will implement. Well, thank you. I, I think um, when I moved to take this position, one of the challenges when you're trying to improve a health system the problems could become very insurmountable. Could be, uh, be financing issues, not enough of it, or misallocated, not enough human resources. The knots are so many. So where do you start? And we had polio, we had measles, we had this one, we had that one. So where do you start? Uh, you can give up or you can do something about it. So two things. One was focusing on uh, a complex system, but focusing on one or two areas where you can actually grab and do something with it to improve the system. So human resources, the human resource agenda was key. And what we've done with the Midwest, putting human resources where they were they needed, actually is one that I believe has made a tangible contribution to the health system. But also picking something that you can demonstrate the reality of change. Uh, polio did that to us. So that when you uh, improve coverage, improve quality, and you see reduction in disease and is independently uh, visible, then it reinforces to everyone that look, this is changeable and you can build momentum on the back of that. So with the polio effort, we're able to take many more initiatives riding on the back of the polio eradication. So successive waves of reforms uh, from uh, routine immunization, the culture and transformation, which I didn't talk much about, uh, the new vaccine introduction to have pentavalent, pneumo, and also rota, changing the policy to do that, um, introducing the midwife service scheme itself, now the community health workforce, some initiatives that ordinarily might be difficult to introduce. But given what we've done with polio, we believe in ourselves more and others believe in us, like, like you said. But one last point that I also want to say is, the, you, yes, you're right, if you go back 20 years ago, there have been plans, excellent plans but they really never moved in national plans. And every country you go, you'll find good national plans written by very qualified consultants, almost to perfection. But nothing happens. And at the end of it all, I think institutions matter. And those institutions uh, have to be strong. And in our own public institution, we tried with your assistant and others, were able to somehow um, strengthen it so it has a capacity to deliver what institutions can deliver beyond just individual capacities. But also latching onto a traditional institution that existed, even though it's not funded by government. It is legitimate, so an institution that is also equally strong to actually work with it. So the failure of our local governance system, for instance, we, 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 we bypassed it using the traditional institution, which was legitimate in the eyes of uh, the population and used it to mobilize them and have the distrust relationship with the program. Uh, so fixing health system is not easy, but at least you have to start somewhere, and that's what we've tried to do in Nigeria. So any other comment or any ideas what we could do better? Because how, I mean, how much of the attention you got was because it was holy? Okay. I think... Um, 
we used the polio effort deliberately. It wasn't, uh, we just stumbled into it because it is polio. The mandate of our agency is to develop the primary health care system. And the primary health care system was failing and routine immunization wasn't there. So polio was a symptom of a much wider difficulty with the, with the health system. But we used it in the sense that we were able to accomplish good results and then reestablish our credibility in the conversation around health system, but go beyond polio. Because uh, before you came, I shared some results from the National Immunization Coverage Survey. Routine coverage of polio has actually gone up, just like missiles. Uh, even CSM rates have actually gone down. Um, the human resource intervention we've done is also. So uh, we, we took the what we sort of look at the whole picture and polio was topical. In 2008, there was a World Health Assembly resolution. If we didn't tackle polio, if I tell people we want to tackle measles, nobody will believe us. But tackling... So what is it about polio? Sorry? Why, what is it about polio? I mean, you made, that was my question. Yes. Why polio would motivate people and not measles? What does polio mean? Okay, putting polio in the global uh, poly eradication initiative perspective. There's eradication issue. There's an eradication issue. I mean, there are four countries that are uh, still endemic with right. polio virus, right. Right. and from 355,000 cases, well, there's 1,600. And suddenly, in Africa, we're the only country that has never interrupted polio okay. transmission. That's what I'm yeah. And we had an outbreak that was exporting polio viruses to other countries. So, in a way, it's a larger global public good tackle. So, and to do that, we need to reach the last mile. And uh, now we've done that, we have to continue to make sure we get our goal of eradication. But beyond that, that inroad, the benefits of the polio eradication that we can uh, let accrue to other areas, like missiles, um, like meningitis with the new conjugate vaccine, like maternal health because it's not a one-time thing. And one of the points I made is about integration. With a thousand facilities under this midwife service scheme, we basically have a thousand retail outlets for basic services, including routine immunization, as well as maternal health services. The reason why I ask is a lot of people are very critical in global terms of these eradication campaigns. They accusation of smallpox is that it distorted and held back the development of health systems for years because we put so much emphasis on eradication. And so there's always been the people, the guinea worm eradication has raised a lot of eyebrows. And now polio, it, it's just interesting historically, there's, there's such mixed feelings, but you're presenting a good reason for, uh, that you're, you're presenting a really good case that eradication as a motivator. Yeah, it's interesting though, because it's, it's taking a vertical approach, right. which we know has huge problems, right. but using the vertical approach in order to create a platform right. for horizontal. Which smallpox did not do, yeah. because the way smallpox was done is you would you would find a case and then it was containment around the case. Right. You didn't worry about the whole population, yeah. and that was the big change. In, well, the only way smallpox got eradicated is we dropped the idea of mass vaccination and went to containment around individual cases because transmission was so local. Whereas in polio, obviously, you can't do that. So yeah, this, is, this is taking one step further because it's not right. just containment around the case. Right, which you can't do with polio. It's, it's really essentially right. using this as a lever to create right. an integrated yeah. Right. right, I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying yeah. <coughs> yeah. explaining smallpox didn't do that. <coughs> and it, got, it got a lot of, I mean, it was great to abolish smallpox eradicate smallpox, but I was there at the time in WHO, and there was a lot of mixed feelings. The public health infrastructure for surveillance against polio, for instance, is one of the best. I know in Nigeria, um, H1N1 surveillance, uh, measles surveillance, I mean, there's lots of capacity. Well, that has become, it's a byproduct of the polio effort in a way, but can be used for other things. Uh, the human resources, but also the community engagement. What we're learning, um, I mean, I showed a picture of a community. Uh, it's an hour and a half boat ride on the northeastern part of Nigeria. The only service that gets to this community is actually the immunization campaign. Uh, so it's when twice a year we have a child health week where beyond polio, uh, you get them bed nets, you give uh, the warming tablets, you, uh, 
do all the uh, health interventions, basically deliver them. It's suboptimal to depend on campaign, but in a way you have to get a balance. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so my question is, um, you're very motivated and I think you've pushed a lot of these things to happen. So what do you see, so I don't know how long the position is going to last for you, but what do you see happening after you leave? It seems like you're a great driving force for it, but do you see it sus being sustainable or do you think it's going to go down as time goes on? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think uh, Will has been uh, with, with us right from the beginning. I think chief executives come and go. And even if I stay over a period of time, there will be a time when I will just have to go. So right from the beginning to build an institutional development as an agenda for the institution. So having a common aspiration, uh, uh, a team, that also believes in that and shaping it together, and systems that actually support the institution to deliver on its goal, improve its own capacity. So if I stop doing what I'm doing today, it may not run the way I will run it, but I think there is sufficient residual capacity that will be left that we will continue moving around the agenda. So the institutional development was built around the, inst the agenda of the institution rather than around the chief executive. Um, that's the exit strategy, and I uh, believe that, um, yes, it's always a concern to sustain uh, gains, especially within the wider context of politics, financing, uh, development partners, and everything. But I am very confident that a lot of what we've done, uh, I mean, Will has been with us many times, he's seen the commitment, uh, the same people who were there before are still there now, but they're doing things differently and they're showing tremendous results. I just went alone. The same team that I had there largely, which has actually... Well, what you should also say, Martin, is you've done a good job of promoting some people farther than others. And some people who thought they should have been promoted weren't. And some people who were a little bit farther down the chain but understood and bought in and see, had, had a vision for where to go, didn't get promoted. And so in a real sense, you, re re you help remake the organization to, to make it more sustainable, rather than just sort of going along with some already based promotion. Yeah. A question along similar lines. What percentage of your funding came from external sources versus regional country sources? And do <coughs> you think that if you eradicate polio, that will change your funding sources and, and jeopardize the program? Yeah. I think, I mean, in what, what people don't appreciate is that um, the polio effort in Nigeria is largely funded by the federal government of Nigeria. The donor contribution uh, is largely limited to the procurement of the vaccines and part funding of the operational costs at the federal level. But the federal government invests uh, in 28 and 29 20 million dollars of our own budget in running the effort. In addition to another $20 million in the routine vaccine effort. So if you, if we eradicate polio, potentially, at least the government's fiscal space will be better. Whether it applies that money to basic services or something else, it will only uh, have to be told when we reach there. But many of our programs, the midwifery service scheme is entirely funded by the government. The impact evaluation of that uh, is what we are now trying to get. Uh, the World Bank has been supporting us with technical assistance to design an impact evaluation uh, rigorously to be able to independently say whether it's made a difference. And that is not funded by government. The MLM program that uh, uh, Will and Duke uh, uh, helped us develop, uh, while the, the support to do it was external, the running of it day to day, we mobilized resources internally. Um, but what we've seen is with the improvement in the institutional capacity, the performance of the agency, we've seen more willingness of our partners to actually use the government system. So EU uh, is funding program on routine immunization through uh, planning in the 10th EDF uh, through us. Uh, we are using some US government grants for HIV within health system, which is a new area for us, uh, and um, uh, together with other partners to actually um, somehow built in our systems 
arrangements such that when the partners are not there, government would be there because um, these services ought to be uh, delivered by government. And uh, so we've, we've moved in that direction. Sounds excellent in the sense that the track record may actually improve funding from external sources. Yeah. And that's, that, that's in the last two years, I think uh, I could say at least 100 million uh, from external partners, not yet with us, but we see that as additional resources that have not traditionally come through government. Uh, because the institution, uh, because it's a parastatal also, and with its performance, with its fiduciary systems, uh, with the people that we've now got, it's positioning itself as a development agency, uh, really domestically, that is going to play a major role. So, so let's pick up on a parallel question, which is Nigeria is not a poor country. Yeah. A lot of money. Um, has, to what extent has the agency raised its profile internally to be able to attract more internal money rather than having to rely primarily on expenses? Yeah. <coughs> Two months ago we did an exercise to look at 2005 to 2010 uh, to see really internal funding of the agency has gone up from 2008, 9, and 10. Obviously there's a short period of time. 2011 is an election year and uh, time when governments are all trying to uh, scale back. So there's some uncertainty around that. But we did a seminar on policy and financing for primary health care on the 3rd of February 2011, deliberately to start to generate debate around public financing for health, <coughs> for basic health, because there are significant equity issues, which I showed in one of the slides. Uh, between poor, rich, where we apply our resources, preventive versus curative, uh, use of insurance mechanisms, community-based health insurance, equity funds, those ideas to bring them to the policy space. It's one thing to have idea somewhere separate, but it's another thing to bring it into the policy space so that you can sell it to the policy makers so that they can take it and actually appropriate against it. So we did that, and it's obvious that Nigeria will need to spend more on health going forward. Uh, we're yet below the Abuja commitment, which is 15% of government budget. Many, many countries in Africa have reached that target. Um, but I believe over time, uh, we will just have to continue hoping that the agency will be able to make its case that it's improving its absorptive capacity, is able to also <coughs> deliver results. The impact evaluation that we are doing for the midwife service scheme is not just to get some new knowledge around whether or not having midwives in rural areas works. It's actually to demonstrate uh, how many lives or how many more women in a very concrete way. The monitoring data is showing utilization going up. But if we're able to demonstrate that mortality has gone down, neonatal mortality has gone down, learn a few lessons, it will be very difficult for government to say, oh, we will not support this program. But if we don't show that, then we cannot argue that government should fund this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, no more questions. Okay. Thanks. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks.